So yesterday I sat in a bunch of about 150 students, all in this place, all being very keen and enthusiastic and in jokes and all the rest of it, the way they do. And uh, <coughs> Glenn Scrivener, I think he's a New Zealander, he's from somewhere else anyway, uh, he said, uh, right, just for a minute, we're talking about sharing our faith and stuff. Just for a minute, I want you to turn to your neighbour. Oh, great, I love it when they do that with students. Turn to your neighbour and I want you to talk about what it was, the characteristics of the person who most influenced you to become a Christian. The person with the biggest input in your life to become a Christian. What was it that characterised that person? Do you know this is interesting? A girl next door but one, because obviously I wasn't a proper person because I'm a speaker and I haven't any hair. Uh, more than you today. But, but uh, I obviously wasn't a proper person, so I was brought into a threesome. Obviously, that's the way to keep me safe. And uh, this girl next but one along from me said, you know, the person who influenced me most in becoming a Christian was my mum. And it's just because she was a Christian every day and she helped me trust God and she prayed for me and said, we'll pray together about this. And she just, he was my mum. How precious is that? How good is that? It's marvellous. He was my mum. And one after another, these little groups and whatever people shared what would what have been, and you could have put it under one word, the, the thing that influenced these young people most, these so-called intellectuals, with all this intellectual stuff and clever stuff that gets done for them. The one thing that influenced them most in becoming a Christian was the consistency of some other Christian person. It was the consistency of a Christian person. And that's what you've got going on in this passage in Titus 2, 1 to 10. Paul has told Titus what he must do. He must appoint elders to erect a sustainable teaching office on Crete because it's a mess. The society's a mess. Sin is rampant in the place. It is notorious even in the pagan ancient world for its, its notoriety in terms of its conduct. Right? And these people have become Christians on Crete and the churches have got the people from Crete in them. Yeah? So what's come in with them? The usual stuff, right? So what you need to do, Paul tells Titus, the reason I left you behind on Crete was so that you could appoint elders in every town to erect a sustainable Bible teaching office. Because what elders do is they pray and they Bible. That's the answer. But now Titus is, has, has been told that's what he's got to do in chapter 1. And now in chapter 2, by, he's been told that by means of life and doctrine, he has to teach the way that these elders need to teach the people. So by his example, by his life and by his teaching, he needs now to be the model for these new elders in these new churches. Making sense? So chapter 2 takes it forward in that sort of way. Titus must <coughs> live before them, teach before them, so that they can have his example for how to get people walking in the way of Jesus on Crete. And he must do this before he moves on to leave them to it as the on-the-ground, sustainable, indigenous elders, teachers and prayers for the Cretan church, a church in a notoriously godless place. So here's what to do. You, however, chapter 2, verse 1, you, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Now, what is appropriate to sound doctrine? Because in Wales you'd think it was a suit and a tie, wouldn't you? What's appropriate to sound teaching? A pulpit, a suit, a tie, probably a large black Bible. Funnily enough, he doesn't go for that one. The primary method by which the Christian church is to be kept in the Christian way is by means of teaching. That's why they need elders on Crete. That's why Paul now prioritises with Titus. His critical role is to teach these Cretan Christians, but what must he teach them? He must teach them that which is in accord with sound doctrine. And that's a different thing. Sound doctrine is the key to it. Te huge ai nusei didascalia. That word there, the middle one, is the word from which we get our, our word for hygiene. Can you see that? I suppose you can, really. Huge ai nusei. I mean, that which is hygienic teaching that which is wholesome, sound, healthy teaching, that which is cleaning teaching, that which is like the detox spray in the kitchen, that teaching. The ministry of the Word of God such that it cleans your work surfaces. Huh. Well, you know what I mean. That's a bit of a mess, that sentence, isn't it? Um, but you see the point. It's the teaching that cleans up your act, which is healthy and wholesome for your soul. 
Now, the last 65 years have seen a recovery of confidence in Welsh evangelicalism in teaching Christian truth, right? It's all teaching, it's all, you know, banner truth books, it's all, you know, that's been great. We've been very, very richly blessed with a resurrection of sound biblical expository ministry, and great guys have done that for us. Sound insofar as the propositional truths conveyed to those inside evangelical congregations are concerned. Sound in that sense. But that word sound there is the word you better translate healthy. Healthy doctrine. The doctrine is the truth that gives health to the body of believers. It is definite. The article indicates that the reference is to a specific teaching. That teaching, not another. The teaching that is in accord with sound doctrine. Sound, healthy doctrine. It's all about that which is healthy and that gives health to the body of believers, as opposed to the other sort of teaching. No doubt the idea is being peddled around on creek by the liars and windbags already referred to in chapter 1, okay? That's less than healthy. This is not that. This is the sound teaching, the one and only. Now, we've had loads of teaching for ages. And in our churches and across our land, it has observably not resulted in a healthy evangelical church across Wales. It hasn't resulted in healthy evangelical church life across Wales. We've had sound teaching, but that's not what this is calling for. It's calling for those who are doing the teaching to teach that which is in accord with healthy doctrine. And that's a different thing. Well, it's not a different thing, but it's, it, it's the same truths, but maybe in a different way. With some few, if any, exceptions, the churches where orthodox doctrine has been recovered are not healthy and thriving today in a spiritual sense. They're more likely to be aging and bickering. Why is that? Because that which is in accord with grace hasn't been taught. Grace has been taught. That which is in accord with a high view of the authority of scripture well, the authority of Scripture has been taught, but where's that which is in accord with it? Do you see what I'm saying? We've got a gap here. Why is it happening? Why are we seeing these problems in churches and, and, and with ministries and so on? Because contrary to what's been said and assumed in this land for the last 75 years, teaching sound doctrine on its own isn't enough. We've got to teach that which is in accord with sound doctrine, which flows from it, which arises out of it, which is consistent with it. Do they use the C word again? consistent and that's what you're to teach on Crete Titus am I making sense stop me now if I'm not can you see what I mean or not I've got some nods and I've got some frowns <laughs> let me see if I can work that out <clears throat> let us assume that I understand the doctrines of grace right I can cross the T's I can dot the I's I'm a five-point Calvinist actually yes I am so how does that lead me to live my life well, what it does is it leads me to be absolutely on the ball with anybody who's remotely loose or remotely looking like an Arminian. You! Well, not you, but... But you see what I mean? How is that consistent with grace? I'll get in a tizzy and a tiz was and a, I'll fly into an absolute... Don't you dare say anything against the sovereignty of God because God's honour is at stake. Hang on. Whose honour is at stake? The honour of the sovereign God is at stake. Do you think he can't look after his own sovereignty and honour? He's the sovereign God. Do you see what I'm saying? The, the things that we believe need to be consistently impacting the things. And, and it's not just enough to teach sound doctrine. We've got to teach that which is consistent with it as well. Otherwise, we'll have war and backsliding and bickering and aging without growth for the next generation. Seriously. Because you need to teach that which is in accord with sound doctrine. And Paul goes on to spell out for Titus what that means in the situation on Crete. He goes on and he works through the family life of the people on Crete because we know that the errors that have been taught have hit the family, right? You know, it's, it's causing havoc in whole households, chapter 1, verse 11 says. So Titus is going to say, look, you know what sound doctrine is? You've appointed guys who know sound doctrine, are able to teach sound doctrine, but look, what is in accord with sound doctrine in the area that's the battlefield in the home itself? 
The older men got to be like this. The older women got to be like that. The younger guys got to be like this. The younger women got to be like that. The slaves got to be like that. So that the household, which has been impacted by the error, now is, is an area, a, a, a playing field. That's not the word I want. Uh, a place where that which is in accordance with sound doctrine is so evidently seen and worked out. Is that making sense? Can I lose some pages off my notes now? Because I've summarized a fair bit. That which is in accord with sound doctrine is the target, is the emphasis, not sound doctrine. Sound doctrine is crucial, sound doctrine is essential, so that we can teach that which is in accord with it, in terms of the way we live our lives, so we embody the truth that we believe. Is that making sense? Is everybody happy or do you think I'm a heretic? Nobody's gone for matches and faggots. So that's pretty good. Not, not those faggots, not peas faggots, you know, okay. Burn the heretic. Right. Titus, you must teach that which is in accord with sound doctrine. Prepo. That which is fitting for sound doctrine. Of course, you've got to teach sound doctrine. But teaching sound doctrine is not coterminous, the way we've thought it has been, perhaps. Coterminous with what an elder or an apostle or any other gospel minister must teach. Coterminous means en begins and ends with. It's a way of using one word instead of several. Begins and ends for. Yeah. That happens when I'm tired. Throw things. <laughs> Big words. Coterminous is a great word. It means it starts and it finishes with that, and of course it doesn't. It doesn't just start and finish with sound doctrine. Sound doctrine is where we start, but we haven't finished. We've got to have that which is in accord with sound doctrine. Here's the life that flows from the things we believe. Yeah? It's easy when you explain it. It just takes explaining, doesn't it? You, you wonder what I'm talking about now. Of course, that's obvious, isn't it? Of course, it's yeah, great. Okay. That which is in accord with it. So earlier this week I was away from this place and I had the privilege of catching up with some old friends and I was saying earlier and from there and, 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 and you know we were able to chat and I had the privilege, the opportunity really, to speak about some really deep things with some friends who've really lost their way and they've lost their way in the area of that which flows from sound doctrine. They've been in churches with sound doctrine more than most Christians in the world can have but it's that which flows from it which gets lost in our context. And I wouldn't hear a word against any of those people. I really wouldn't. They've, they've all set out on the Christian way, but for one reason or another, they've lost the way and they've fallen into serious harm. Serious. Hurting themselves. Hard experience for them. And it seems even harder to work out how are they going to resolve that satisfactorily. And on two occasions in particular, I found myself urging them to get in the way. Into the way. Get on the way. Like... Being a Christian is a matter of being on the way. Because we're told all the time it's a matter of believe this, believe that, believe that, and pray that prayer. Yeah? Well, yeah, that, that's important. But it's a matter of living on the way. What, what is Jesus? How does Jesus describe what he's bringing? He's bringing a message. Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Right? That's what he brings, isn't it? Galilean ministry. Repent, believe. What do I mean, repent? We mean get off the way you're on and get on this way. Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets, say all those apostles in the, in the Acts as they're preaching in the early church, as people are being converted in droves. Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets. Get on the way. Follow him. What's Jesus teaching people to do as, as, as his disciples? There's the word. Uh, as he's wandering around Galilee and what, what, wandering around the foothills of Judea. And as he goes into the temple, what's he calling on people to do? Follow me. And I'll make you vicious, vicious old men. Yeah? So, so... Uh, Mess that song up all the time. Uh, fishers of men, that's it. Um, it's a call to follow. And the whole work, you know, this disciple thing. You're a disciple of, when you become a Christian, you become a disciple of Jesus. They didn't even call people Christians for yonks. People were first called Christians at Antioch as a term of abuse. Before that, it was, it was you're a follower of Jesus. You're following in the way. You know, I follow Jesus according to the way, says Stephen. We've got to urge people sometimes to get back in the way. The way of that which is in accord with sound doctrine. We've, we've lost in our Western consciousness that that is what it's about. Yeah, we're put right with God by grace through faith alone. Because I couldn't put myself right by trying to follow him. He's just too good for me. Okay, But having been put right with God by grace through faith alone, I'm grateful. I'm full of thankfulness for what he's done. And I'm going to follow his way because his way is right. Jesus does fulfill the law and the prophets. He does show us the way to God. 
He is the way, the truth, and the life. Remember that one? That's a good one. Um, good song. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus said. Do you remember that? You did get Sunday school early enough. It's brilliant. Uh, so yeah, the way is what it's about. Before it was ever a religion, before it was ever called Christianity, the Lord called people to follow him in the way. And that's how so much of the appeal of Christ's message was conveyed from the start. Come follow me in the way. Repent and come this way. It wasn't a call to believe a list of intellectual points in great detail, though that's very important. It was a call to entrust yourself to Christ so far as to turn back from the way you're on, turn to following the Christ who fulfills the law of the prophets as a disciple who walks in Christ's way. Yeah, faith saves you. Yes, it does. Really trusting him to walk in his way. That's what faith is. And you express that trust in him by turning from sin, repentance, expressed through public baptism, yeah, that's important, which symbolizes death to the old way <laughs> thanks way and and setting out on living a new way in a resurrected to live a new life in a new way what's paul asking for here in titus 2 1 following he's asking for titus to teach that which is in accord with sound doctrine which amounts to following christ in the way because it's right and because we're grateful that he saved me As I say, he then give examples of how that works in the household because it's the household that's under attack by the false teachings that are happening on Crete. Yeah? So first of all, then the older men. Oh, aren't commentaries wonderful? Uh, they go around all the ancient world and they try and find out how old an older man is. Why? You know what an older man is? I know what an older man is. It's a relative term. But, no, apparently Philo reckons that older man is between 50 and 66 years old. What you get to be when you're past 66, no idea. It's pretty general, isn't it? You're an older guy. I feel like an old guy. I know, don't say I look like one. Uh, yeah, I do feel like an old guy. What should I be like? Titus, you to teach the older guys to be temperate, to be worthy of respect, to be self-controlled, to be sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. There's three under that word, healthy sound at the end. See that? So here's what happens. Temperate. The meaning of the term temperate ranges from the original meaning of cautious with the use of wine, which we understand, to just sober-minded, you know? Metaphorical use, just sober-minded. Now, if you look at what, what he says about the older women, he tells them not to be drunken. So it's as if he's telling, you know, if you balance it up, and I suppose you really should, we can reckon it's towards the, the wine stuff with the older guys as well. Because he's going to have to be fair, otherwise the older women and the younger women are going to be unruly, right? So we don't want that either. So, so I reckon it's probably, he's telling them, just watch out for the, you know, the little nip of an evening. Just have enough control of yourself to control your alcohol use. And we know that needed doing in contemporary society because people had thrown off restraint. The, it, was, it was something that secular commentators were talking about, the way that you know, people were going to these dinners and getting too much in them, food and drink. And then all sorts happened after dinner around the table. Not good. Uh, Bruce Winter's book is very good. If you see that on Amazon. I haven't got it, but I've read bits and pieces of it. And very interesting about the things that were happening in contemporary society in the first century in the Roman world. And this stuff that Paul is saying to Titus, it really does arise alongside a lot that the contemporary commentator was saying about the way the world was going down the pan. All this stuff is going wrong in our society. And Paul is saying, don't be like that. Don't be like that. As a consistent Christian, you're going to be turning away from that to Jesus. Make sense? Temperate. Worthy of respect. There'll always be people who diss you. But he says worthy of respect. He doesn't say respected. Because there are people who are respected who are not worthy of respect. You know, it works two ways, doesn't it? He's saying worthy of respect. Seriousness that commands respect. Not being a lightweight, being, being a serious sort of person. That's what he's saying. Be a serious sort of person. The people who know when to take seriously. Self-controlled or sensible. Measured restraint. Now here is a counter-cultural thing. It's Because it's a counter-human thing. It's counter their culture. It's counter ours. Measured restraint. The ability to say no to yourself. That's powerful actually. People see that. They know there's something going on. Because... People tend not to say no to themselves very much. Be that. 
the opposite of the foolishness for which Crete is renowned. Be that, self-controlled and sound. Be a sound sort of guy. Sound? Hmm. Sound in faith, in love and in endurance. Sound in those three areas. Healthy in terms of your spiritual life. Three dimensions. Faith, which is the appropriate human response of quiet trust in the sovereign God. Love, meant in the sense of self-sacrificial service done for one another, reflecting what Jesus Christ has done for us, and God though he was. And endurance. Endurance is part of this triad of components in being sound in the faith. It's important to, be sound in the, to being sound in the faith. If you're going to be sound in the faith, you're a guy who's going to endure as an older guy. Life doesn't get easier, life gets harder, yeah? So many times. Endure. Now maybe that's about persevering in following Christ in the hostile society that is Crete. Maybe it's about the conflict in church and in households that arises from the false teaching. Households are in chaos there. Certainly older men should have learned to trust Christ wholly, to lay down their lives in self-sacrificial service through long exposure to the self-sacrifice of Christ by meditating over how he has been and what he has done and by living on his grace and therefore have in their psyche, in their makeup, all the elements of faith and spiritual provisioning that enable perseverance and endurance in faith and in love. Perseverance is a dignified thing, isn't it? The ability to persevere. It's a manly thing. Older men. And then he moves across to the older women. Now, remember, the wife and husband are counterparts to one another. Created to be such in Genesis. They'll be swinging out opposite one another. And we know there's trouble in the households of Crete, right? Because he tells us in chapter 1, verse 11. So that's the background. Teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. What's the role of women in the church? We had this in our conference. It was good. Oh, it was all agreed. It was brilliant. It was, it was plenty, there were loads of women there. The importance of women in church planting. And there you go. Teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Reverent. We're not talking about the reverend Tims, right? We're not talking about, you know, children's programs on the telly or programs on the telly. What does it mean to be reverent? Uh, interesting term. It's a term that was used to describe the way the demeanour of pagan priests and prophetesses as they went about their temple rituals. Do you feel blessed by that? No. Um, conscious of the presence of God? How would you live if God was standing next to you? Reverently. Hmm? Reverently. Godly mindedness. So like the older men, the older women must give evidence in their outer lives of their inner walk with God. Consistency. Life consistent with the faith that's professed in the church. Does that make sense? Now getting control of the next two things is going to be key to that. They're going to need to get control of their, their tongues and their throats. Yeah? Not slandering. Not giving people a bad name. Nor addicted to too much wine. But to teach what's good. Again, Bruce Winter's book, Roman Wives. I've seen a bit of that. Um, on, online I've been able to see a bit of that and it shows how contemporary critique of social conduct particularly of women at this point raises these very issues about the way women were behaving in first century Roman society too much of this too much of this and there's outrage about it it's typical of the so-called liberated women of the day because women were coming into this sort of liberated a woman can do anything a man can do and behave and just do what they want and throw off all restraint and all that sort of thing uh, all that was going on in their era, as well as it has in ours. And women were behaving at banquets in appalling ways. Their mouths were out of control and their throats were out of control. And there was a problem with those things that everybody realised. And Paul is arguing, consistent with the Gospel, Christian culture should stand out as different from that. 
teach that which is in accord with sound doctrine. And this is what it's going to look like, older ladies. We've had situations in the past. I was visiting with some people just recently where, you know, I was a young minister in a church and I was longing for some of the older women who were new Christians to just pick up and deal with and teach stuff. And I was having to sort of try as a young guy in ministry trying to teach the older women to teach the younger women because I wasn't going to do that, you know? So, uh, yeah, it's kind of, kind of important. It's absolutely crucial and relevant ministry. So these older women then, they're to teach what is good, a singularly important role in Christian households. What are they to teach? Who are they to teach? They're to teach the younger women. Here it comes. To love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. What sort of impact is that going to have on Crete if you produce homes like that? Let's be honest about it. Home is the hardest place to be a consistent Christian, isn't it? Here he is. This is for me. Not good at this. Want to be. But having a home like that? That's going to say a lot to people if they see that. You older women need to have this particular pattern of life so that you're in a position to be able to teach the younger women to do this. To be distinctive in their homes as they live within their godless society which is pushing them in the opposite direction to this. As is ours. Social pressures in first century society were very similar to the ones we've seen since the 60s in the UK. And these things, again, were all things that contemporary critiques identified as having been lost in the new way of looking at womanhood. Things that had become current at the time. So love for husbands as opposed to philandering and wandering off and not being a one-woman man, one-man woman. It was one of those ways around. <laughs> not philandering. Being self-controlled rather than diving into the sea of dissipation that, that was opening... It's opportunities to you. Purity as opposed to making a virtue out of being sinfully modern. Running the home well instead of being constantly in the coffee shop gossiping with the girlfriends or seeking satisfaction in ways that are not constructive. Subject to husbands and not even go in there. Instead of being inveterately self assertive what did Jesus do was he self assertive no this is in accordance with sound doctrine why why on earth should we buy all that countercultural stuff why so that no one will malign the word of God now you, you could have thought that um, the situation with, with Crete would be, you know, you want to bring more and more people to know Jesus, so we've just got to show that we Christians are just as cool as the others out there. Not many people become Christians because they've got Christian friends who are really cool and just like everybody else. People become Christians because of the guys that are a bit daggy, you know, a bit awkward, a bit, they stand out. When somebody in the changing room, for example, in a, in a team of some description, has got a problem, it's, it's the guy in the corner who's the known Christian. He's going to be consistent. He's going to be straight with you. He's the guy you go and talk to. It's the counterintuitive we need. It's the distinctive Christian we need. It's the, that which is in accord with sound doctrine that is going to result in people not maligning the word of God and not the other way around. So that no one will malign the word of God. Okay, so what sort of younger man is worthy of and able to lead a home like that? <laughs> Titus really gets it in the neck from Paul about what's going to happen for the younger guys because this is just countercultural, difficult to achieve. What sort of younger man leads a home like that? Paul is, is getting there. Encourage the young men to be self controlled. Now, that's what you've got to do, that's what you've got to encourage them. But all the rest of this is Paul telling Titus what he's got to look like to give the lead to these guys who need to be like this. Do you see what I mean? 
There's one thing you've got to do, you've got to tell them, but in everything, set them an example by doing what's good. Give leadership to young men. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they've got nothing bad to say about us. The key is to be disciplined, not out of control. So phronial, be sensible. And sexual indulgence and excesses of all kinds were the norm in Cretan society as they are in ours. And self-control is therefore going to be the rather noble, rather manly antidote to being dragged into all that stuff. For Christian young men, you're going to have to be disciplined. That's the outworking of the repentance that's born of faith. Self-discipline is the outworking of repentance born of faith. Is that making sense? Where do you explain that? What I do then, when I become a Christian, is I turn from sin and I trust Jesus. Right? How do I work that out? Self-discipline. Does that make sense? I say no to myself and I go another way. Self-control is going to be the key to it. And these young men need leadership. They need a peer group. They need good mentoring and example setting to create the plausibility structure in which they can exercise self-control, in which it's okay to be a disciplined young man and where that can grow. Titus is to model it with dignity and with leadership. Show these things, self-control, do what's good, show integrity, seriousness, sound as a speech that cannot be condemned. I spoke with a Christian young woman not long ago who's got the seven shades of trouble and wandering. And I suspected that the poor level of Christian consistency amongst the available, shall we say, young Christian men may have had a little to do with their wandering. So I thought, oh, I'm going for this one. I asked fairly directly, what, what is it? Just help me, help me understand this, because I'm finding this troubling. What, just what is it with Christian men? And a small controlled explosion occurred. <laughs> it wasn't small. It wasn't that controlled. Desperation. There was a small explosion. For the sake of the things that Paul tells us here are very important and should be held dear, these issues need to be desperately addressed. They need to be addressed for the removal of the sort of stumbling that discredits the gospel of God, that it discredited the gospel of God in this person's life. Because of what she saw, of the Christian young man she saw at university. I think she said they spooked me out or they freaked me out. I don't know what it was. Um, but it was something strange. And then an explanation. None of the things that Paul is describing here. They discredit the gospel of God. And they bring people to grief. And Paul then goes on to talk about slaves. And how slaves are to win over their masters and so on and so forth. Okay? Don't think we got any with us. Yeah? But again, what it does for us is it serves to illustrate... The sacrifice of what feels like your own self-interest in following the example of Christ for a far better outcome in the end. And that's what applies to all these categories of people in the household. Live like this in the household. Not living for what you think is going to satisfy you, but living for what God says is going to satisfy you because you're going to get a far better outcome and much more satisfaction in the end. It's going to be a better way to go. And so you're saying, right, you expect us to be like real freaks in our world. And the question is, why would I do that? For the grace of God has appeared to offer salvation to all people. And if you've got it, gratitude for that is what motivates you to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And that's where the rubber hits the road. Gratitude motivates, not law. Grace motivates to live like this, not law. If you haven't got grace, you won't be living like this. But, frankly, that's next week. Relieved? The grace of God that has a... a that bring, I've got this in a, a different version in my head, okay? I can't read that. It's jarring with me because I've remembered it in a different... Yeah. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, meaning mankind. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions as we live the lives that are detailed here.
in this present evil age until he comes, while we await his coming and his appearing. The key word was consistent, wasn't it? The key word was consistent with grace, which motivates us to a life 